few reasons why operations management is important and uh, what is the definition of operations management and uh, how this course is organized so that you can understand operations management better. So uh, three topics I included are the essence of operations management and the criticality of operations management and the pillars of operations management. The essence of operations management. What is operations management? And uh, after taking this class, I hope you can define operations management and know what it is uh, in a succinct way. Uh, operations management can be defined as the set of activities that create value in the form of goods and services by transforming inputs into outputs. And uh, this is a definition by Dr. Hansu Kim. Um, I really liked this definition because it talks about value. Um, operations management is not just about doing things efficiently. You know, that's how people understand operations management. But I would say more important aspect is to create value. Even though you do things efficiently, that does not mean that you are creating value. Rather, you might be doing uh, things very efficiently and create things that are not necessary or helpful to the customers. So when you are talking about operations management, please always think about the customer's needs and try to become a customer-centered and create things that are needed and meeting customers' needs more, more effectively. And that's what we are going for in operations management. Another thing that I want to talk about is transforming inputs into outputs. Operations is all about transformation. You know, uh, for example, I am uh, delivering this lecture. This lecture can be on, on operation. You know, I am uh, sourcing many knowledge and then transforming into a few critical things and delivering them to you uh, as a knowledge. Uh, so that it can be helpful for you to understand what operations management is. So, you know, everyone or every activity should aim to transform inputs into output so they can be helpful to the, to the customers, to the societies, to the company, to the stakeholders, and all the constituents of the uh, activity. So what activities do we mean? You know, we have so many economic activities. Uh, it can be production, it could be marketing, it could be finance, it could be entrepreneurial activities. Any activities can be regarded as operations activity. And uh, the question is how to define the value? You know, how should we define the value? What, what does it mean to create value? And that's uh, something very philosophical. And uh, as an honor student, I hope you think about how to value uh, your productivity or how to value um, the utility of a product or service. Um, usually in operations, we go for productivity. Productivity is defined as uh, output over input. If you create things more effectively, then we say, oh, wow, it's productive. You, know, you say, I took six classes in this semester and got 4.0 GPA. Wow, you have been very productivity, productive. So we usually talk about productivity and people say, if you say took seven classes and produced uh, you know, GPA of 4.0, then wow, you have been really productive. And Gino said he's going to finish his uh, graduate school Undergraduate, both undergraduate and graduate school in four years. So that's very pro productive. However, we can also go with quality. You know, how much did we learn? You know, um, degree is one thing, but learning is another, right? So you can take classes and, and get good GPAs. That does not mean that you really learned something important. Uh, so um, they, there are other types of measures that gauge uh, the, the productivity or the quality of something. And we have to be very careful about these measures because depending on the measures, the, the um, behavior changes. So we want to pick the right measures that um, 
determine value of a product or activities so that uh, it can be meaningful for us. But anyway, going back to productivity, in operations management, usually we use productivity. In finance, we use uh, uh, cash flow and uh, profit and revenue. Those are the things that we use. So then um, we, we take a look at operations management from value creation perspective. Um, we go through this operational process and we arrive at uh, output and we have so many inputs together such as material, measurement, methods, machine and people. All kinds of things go into these operations and come out as an output. Output of service, output of uh, product. If it's a healthcare operation, I know one of you have worked in healthcare system and uh, you know in healthcare system, what is the output? Output should be health, right? Healthy life. Uh, that should be the output. Or it could be uh, timely treatment. If it is a stroke patient, time is uh, a life. In three hours, the patient has to be treated. Otherwise, the patient will become uh, paralyzed uh, or permanently damaged. So time is very important output of uh, a healthcare system. Anyway, you know, we put lots of materials uh, in healthcare system, uh, ambulance and doctors and nurses and uh, uh, the hospital and medical equipment. So many things are going in to this healthcare system operation and come out as a quality care for patients and uh, uh, the treatment of diseases or wounds and accidents, those things come out. And we can say that this is a value for the healthcare operations. So operations management can be defined as a process that transform these inputs into quality outcomes. That's a black box of operations management. This is called a black box because although we know that, oh yeah, some materials, some methods are going in, but uh, uh, each company, each person, each organization have different operations management system and that is like a black box. We don't know what's going on. However, depending on this black box, the quality of our outputs are quite different. For example, you know, uh, Toyota and BMW and Benz or Ford, they do have very similar operational systems, but the quality is very different. And what, what is the reason they have different operations management? That's why they are so different. And we want, we call uh, operations management as a black box because we want to know what the differences are, uh, what differentiate them from uh, the other and what kind of methods they use and they could achieve that excellence through their operations. So we call it black box of operations management. And what matters the most is that through this black box, uh, the operation achieves value for customers. That's the most important thing. If you look at the business model, uh, the same thing can be said. You know, business is usually consists of supplier, customers, and employees, and all of them are working together as a business activities, and then uh, materials and other inputs coming in, and uh, product service is supplied to customers, and employees are also uh, offering labors for these business activities. Through these business activities, we are creating something for customers and we can largely say this whole thing as a black box of operations management. When you create good value, what happens? Employees create values through their labor, suppliers through their materials and logistics, and customers are going to receive the value. And what happens is that uh, we create revenue, right? Revenue can be divided into cost and profit and we can say the more profit we are creating, uh, we can say that uh, we are creating more values in business terms. Uh, but you know, in some cases, you don't really uh, create a lot of profit for, for the society, yet you are creating ex uh, ex extensive value for the society. For example, COVID-19 test. You know, um, COVID-19 test is not being done to make money but to, to stop 
uh, stop the uh, spread as soon as possible. In the case, I think costs will be actually exceeding the profit and you know resulting in the deficit. Yet it creates value. So we don't say that uh, uh, profit is the only measure of value. However, in many businesses, I would say profit can be equated with the values. So we want to know the value and defining value is very important. It depends on the philosophy of each organization. And by uh, meeting the uh, customer's needs through creativity and also efficiency or productivity, we achieve this goal. Second topic of this class is the criticality of operations management. In other words, why is operations management indispensable in business? And I would summarize it as coin. Here we have a, a coin, Abraham Lincoln, we can see. And coin stands for, uh, C is for cost saving, and O is for organizational employment, and I is for innovation, N is for national chain effect, that's coin, C-O-I-N. Let's first take a look at cost saving perspective. Here is a, a business case. Currently, it makes $100,000 of sales, not much, but uh, let's uh, consider this case together. Cost of goods is $80,000 and gross margin is $20,000. And final finance costs such as borrowing money uh, um, or insurance costs or something like that is $6,000. And subtotal will be $14,000. And uh, you pay taxes at 25%. And that is 30,500. 30, and the remaining contribution margin is going to be $10,500. This is the current business situation. And now we consider three scenarios, marketing option and finance accounting option and operations management option. The first option, marketing option, is that say you increase sales revenue by 50%. Um, so somehow you, know, you found a new market a uh, new customer, new reason, or you simply hit the, uh, hit the cord very right and uh, you are able to increase the revenue by 50%. And what happens? The sales increase from $100,000 to $150,000 and cost of goods uh, increases and then your contribution margin comes down to $18,000. So you improved your contribution margin by $6,500, or no, $7,500. And finance option, say you reduce it, finances cost by 50%. In other words, cost of goods was $80,000 uh, before, but now it should be $40,000, right? Yeah, so finance was $6,000, now you have, you reduce it by 50%, it becomes $3,000. So the contribution margin is going to be 12,750 from current option, 10,500. It increased to 12,750, an increase of $2,250. Lastly, OM option is to reduce production costs by 20%. And what happens? Cost of goods from $80,000 and you decrease it by 20%, so $16,000 then then you have $64,000 as cost of goods. And if you go to, uh, to the contribution margin, the resulting contribution margin is $22,500. So if you look at uh, these scenarios, then uh, what's your conclusion? What do you see here? Can anybody comment on it? Uh, so Whopper's uh, management is only reducing production costs by 20%, but it's having the biggest impact across the uh, three options. So it's delivering the most uh, value per percentage. That's correct. Very good, very good observations. So Tyler, thank you for answering. Uh, so then the next question is, why do you think only 20% of cost reduction in production has greater impact on your profit margin than marketing option of 50% of increase in sales and 50% of finance, financial cost reduction. Why do you think that is the case? Can anybody comment on that? I would say it's because it 
goes operations management goes directly into the products whereas like marketing and finance finance like involve the product but aren't like going directly into making the product so when you start delaying like and affecting the actual product getting made you're not going to make as much money i see thank you for sharing your insight with us. Uh, and i agree with you that uh um, saving the cost, production costs directly go into each product and it boosts the profit margin. Very good. Uh, anyone else? Um, with the OM, like you can reduce production costs because that's like something that like you can completely control. But like with marketing, it kind of depends on like whether or not like the consumers will actually like take to that and like actually want to buy more stuff. So like you're more in control when you reduce production costs. Oh, that's a very good point, Ali, Alia, uh, that, you know, a production is something within your control, but as often it is the case, marketing or uh, finance option might not be in, under your control. It's uh, external factors, so it's very hard to predict. Very good. Anyone else? Um, to be entirely honest, I'm a little bit confused why decreasing cost of goods sold by 20% would yield the highest contribution in the, this aspect. I think that's so confusing. Rocco, I, I really appreciate your honest comments. Um, yeah, that's why we are discussing that only 20% of reduction can be more powerful than you know 50% of increased sales or 50% of financial cost reduction. So that's uh that can be um that can be you know puzzling. <laughs> so why is that the case? That's what we are trying to answer here. Um can anybody try to share your opinion, your insights here? I would say when sales increases then um you're paying more money to actually produce the goods because you're paying more, like if you were selling like a hundred units and then all of a sudden you're selling 150 units, then you got to pay the additional costs to produce those additional 50 units. Very good observation. So, so Rocco, go ahead. Um, is it because cost of goods sold is the, um, when you do that at 20 has the uh, Sorry, you broke up. I don't know if it's my problem or Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just saying because um, if you keep sales consistent, cost of goods sold is the highest expense, like marginally over like financial costs and taxes. So if you decrease that by 20%. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good observation as well. So look at the cost structure of current business. Cost of goods is 80% of the cost of the sales, right? So you make, say, uh, $100 of sales, $80 is gone because of the cost of production. So cost of production, or production is take, taking up the largest portion of the cost. And if you have a small impact on cost of goods, then it is going to have rippling impact to the whole organization because of that reason, because cost of goods is the largest chunk of a business. And that is often the case in business that, you know, you put, you are spending a lot of money. You do spend a lot of money marketing and other things, but uh, cost of goods or production is the largest chunk of business. That's why when you have just a little saving in, in cost of goods per product, it will have a rippling impact on the other part of your business too. Does it make sense? So the first reason why operations management is critical is because the cost, it saves lots of cost with a small impact. So that's why we want to pay attention to these operations. Here's an example that I can show you. Um, look at this a grab. Uh, here is the original design. If you can, please count how many bolts and nuts and parts do you see in this product? 20? I, I think so. 
Then you revise the design and uh, you simplify everything. Then you have this one piece base and eliminate, eliminate lots of fasteners. What kind of benefit do you expect from this? Lower production cost. Yep. Lower production cost. Oh, go ahead. No, that's what I was going to say too. Very good. Anything else? Uh, more Except customer satisfaction because it's less parts. Very good. If I have to, if I if I have to um, assemble them together, I'll be I'll be mad because <laughs> I have to spend a lot of time to re to assemble them. What about sourcing? You know, if you are sourcing these parts from suppliers, your supply chain is going to be more complex than before. What about inventories? You are managing more types of inventories and carry them around, and that's going to be a pain for you too. So in many senses, you know, logistics or supply chain or warehouse or assembly, by saving the or simplifying the design, you will be able to achieve very good impact on your uh, profit margin. And if you even further uh, simplify the design, say, now you have design for push and snap assembly. You don't have to even use any bolt and nuts. You just snuggle them in. Then it's going to be even better, right? So by doing so, you can have a very good impact on your profit margin. So we know um, uh, Tyler works for Starbucks. Um, here is an example from Starbucks. And Starbucks uh, did some research and found ways to improve their uh, product, uh, product or service uh, procedures. And what they did was simple things. For example, they stopped requiring signatures for credit card purchases. And they also changed the size of the ice scoop and saved 14 seconds per drink. And new espresso machine saved 12 seconds per shot. And this simple uh, improvement resulted in $200,000 to $940,000 uh, in six years per, uh, the, the, uh, per the shop. So in that way, they could have achieved very good profit margin. It's a small improvement, but because of, of its uh, savings, they were able to boost their margin. And uh, uh, productivity also improved by 27%, about 4.5% per year. So Tyler, is there any other example from Starbucks that they improve their operations and therefore their profit margin? Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff that's coming down recently. So uh, really quickly, uh, Blonde Espresso used to have a different sequence of uh, pumps, like different amount that you put into those cut up drinks by made a blonde. And so now they're changing that where everything's kind of comes out the same way. So by having less complexity, in the drinks, uh, you spend less time as a barista thinking about how to make it properly. So Excellent. it's something that doesn't require any new production. It just uh, adjusts the menu that there's really not that much of a noticeable difference and it's uh, faster to produce the same products. Excellent. Right. Small improvements resulted in very good uh, uh, savings. Any other examples that you can think of? Uh, operations management saving cost, small improvements, bringing uh, good impacts to the business. Okay, Rocco. Oh. So uh, I know that a lot of industries right now because of COVID are using a more streamlined employee service. Um, yeah, that's a interesting question. You know, working at home, did it really that decision to work at home, did it really improve productivity or decrease productivity? Um, and that's a very good question. And I'm hoping to explore that question. That's a very good research question. Uh, as a person in my, or as an organization or business, it might be a little bit detrimental to the business because you are not seeing the person in person and uh, you cannot monitor what the person is doing. So um, I'm not so sure about that. I need to see the data. But as a society, as a nation, I think it's a good thing because now we spend more time with our family members or friends 
and we save gas and and uh, uh, time and everything. So uh, that aspect should should be considered as well. Uh, one example that I can talk about is um, I don't know this one. <laughs> one example that I can talk about is um, having the the machine prepared before doing the downtime. For example, business hours nine to five, and right after that, for thirty minutes, you ask you know your employees to take turns to have your equipment or shelf or everything ready. Uh, so that uh, you don't have to spend the time uh, while uh, customers are in business or coming to your shop. By doing so, you can have your operations ready and uh, it's cleaner and everything is organized. By doing that, uh, it will uh, give a better impression to your customers. Now, second thing, second reason why operations management is critical is because of Organization and employment. Uh, I would say, um, you know, organization employment. In other words, which department or which area, which section of business are hiring the most number of employees? That's the question. Uh, operations management is very critical because it offers the potential to hire more people than the other functions of business. Look at this. Um, graph from, from uh, Thompson 2012 that shows um, the uh, GDP amount being created in each sector of, of, of the economy. For example, finance in 1947 was creating about 10.5% of GDP in the United States. Over the years, finance has grown so quickly and steadily and now in, as of 2009, 21.4% of GDP is created there. Uh, similarly, government has been you know, more, or, more uh, also the same, 12.5 and 12.13.6%, not much increase. Now, profession, professional and business services, such as you know, consulting, uh, that increased from 3.3% to 12.1%. So we have seen a huge increase uh, in professional services. Uh, surprisingly, wholesale or retail trade has decreased from 15.9% to 11.5%. So I see, I was a little bit surprised to see that. Oh, I don't know why this is keep on happening. And um, manufacturing, the, the most stri striking example is manufacturing. Uh, it used to take up 25.8% of the, of the GDP in the nation, but now we all outsourced a lot of manufacturing in the country to other places. As a result, we have only 11.11% 11 .11 of GDP produced in manufacturing. And as a result, thousands of jobs are lost in the United States. Education increased, information increased a little bit, construction a little bit, uh, but uh, the, the stark a contrast in, in comparison to finance is that the, America has lost many jobs in manufacturing. So manufacturing has be ha, used to be the biggest factor uh, or section that uh, hired more workers in the United States now, but that potential is lost in the United States. The third reason why operations management is important is because of value creation or innovation. If you think about uh, operations management, you know, I want to bring your attention to innovation. If you think about many functions in business, innovation takes place in many functions. However, the critical innovation takes place in operations management. Um, for example, let's talk about uh, Henry Ford. And, you know, when Henry Ford was creating this car, um, the craftsmen were producing or manufacturing the car at the time, and it was really expensive at the time, uh, running for $1,000. And uh, Henry Ford's vision was to decrease the price so that, you know, common man can drive a car and, and own the car and travel to 
wherever the he or she wants to. So uh, his vision was to uh, decrease the, the manufacturing cost and lower the price for the car for everyone in the nation and the world. So that was his vision. And how shall he achieve that vision? He thought about it. And as you know, what he came up with was, you know, to use uh, assembly line system rather than the craftsman system, which was prevalent at the time. So he innovated the production process and invented this assembly line where you don't have to be skilled to make a car. You just need to do one thing, specialize in it and do it well and uh, make a good money too. And at the same time, the company was able to reduce the manufacturing cost and lower the, the cost. So $1,000 to, to $500, he, he uh, reduced the cost. And then later, it was about uh, $300. So many uh, you know, common man was able to afford a car later, and he was uh, able to uh, serve the country and people with a car and car industry. So that was his contribution. Then that innovation came from Henry Ford, which made uh, the, the convenience and uh, wealth of the nation so far. There is, sorry about that. Here's another innovation. Um, further, if you go back uh, now, um, if you look at uh, manufacturing facility, they are, they are using you know, assembly line, line process, but some of them are using this cell process, U-shaped work cell. And if you observe this one, before you had these five workstations, you have still five workstations, but, uh, but there are advantages uh, over traditional line. Can anyone tell me what advantage you have by changing traditional line flow to work cell flow, U-shaped work cell flow? What, are, what kind of innovations do you see here? Better communication. That's right, very good. So from five people, now you can um, operate this process with people because you can rotate the work and you can handle them more. Very good. So any, any other advantage do you see? I think does it reduce time because each one of them are assigned the same number at the assembly line as the workshop. So they could all like work together instead of one guy waiting for the first guy to get the work done so he can proceed further. Very good. So uh, collaboration, before it was a one-man work, but now it's a collaborative nature. So you can work together with three people. And if you like, you can change, you know, you can shift your workstation from 60 to 30 or 60 to 20. And uh, that's uh, another advantage. Communication has increased um, immensely by using this work cell. Very good. So uh, traditional line is like that, but nowadays we use U-shaped work cell. By doing so, this simple innovation has increased uh, the work skills of the employees and uh, the diversity of the work and, and productivity. Now, the third reason, so we talked about cost saving and organization employment. Now we talk, and third one is innovation. Fourth one is national chain impact. So, National chain impact is um, that uh, operations management has a chain impact in business. So let's take a look at uh, this. If you look at the uh, U.S. economy from 1977 to 2002, um, you, you will see very close correlation between manufacturing sector and total economy. When manufacturing sector was doing good, the total economy was also doing good. However, when manufacturing sector was suffering from recession, the total economy also suffered from recession. Uh, the similar thing, similar trend we see from 1997 to 2012, uh, the total economy and real manufacturing uh, has shown very similar patterns there. If you look at the U.S. trade balance, manufactured goods versus services, um, the red line represent for services and uh, 
a blue line we present for manufacturing goods. Um, you know, in 70s and early 80s, we were in surplus part in manufacturing. However, from 1991, the research, uh, the uh, deficit has deepening and the value was uh, uh, deepening too. And uh, we are in this situation. In terms of service, for example, education, you know, people are coming to the United States to get services and uh, professional consulting. Uh, those things we see uh, uh, we are on the surplus side. However, um, the deficit is uh, overshadowing this uh, 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 surplus of, from the service side. What about um, high tech area? You know, you might say that oh yeah, you know, United States has been outsourcing low uh, technology area to other countries, but high tech area we are doing very, doing good. However, if you look at the high-tech area, um, United States has been gradually losing their market and importing more than exporting in high-tech, such as electronics or manufacturing equipment. Uh, those things are included here. Uh, look at uh, uh, this, this red line. Red line is China, and China was on the deficit side till 1998, and afterward, they came to this positive or surplus side and after 2002 and three, they took off and they became the exporting country in terms of high tech area as well. And that explains why the United States uh, is suffering from a huge deficit in the government and uh, trade deficit as well. Another example could be Germany and Japan. Um, I believe you have watched Pearl Harbor, right? And I also very enjoyed watching Schindler's List. In fact, when I was in college, I watched the Schindler's List. I hope you watched it if you have not done so. It's worth watching uh, Schindler's List. And anyway, right after World War II, both Germany and Japan were uh, in very difficult situation. They were literally flattened and uh, devastated. However, within 20 years, these both two countries have come back as power nations. And as you know, they are G7 nations right now. And especially Germany is taking the leading role in the development of European Union. So the question is, how could Japan and Germany, although they were devastated due to war and their uh, defeat, um, they were devastated, yet they could come back to the world stage as power nations so quickly within two de decades? That is the question. What do you think about that? Anyone would like to share your thoughts about it? Uh, could you repeat what you said, but what's the question? The question is how could Japan and Germany uh, come back to the world stage as power nations? Uh, although they were devastated by the World War II. Um, I think they concentrated solely on like particular industries, like ger how Germany uh, focused on more towards the autom automotive center, and Japan was able to work around the tech and is like a tech giant today. So they were just focusing on particular sectors instead of the whole economy, which helped them basically grow other sectors too. Oh, thank you for sharing your insight, Kunz. Um, yes, so these nations are known for their operational excellence. If you talk about operations, uh, you are reminded of um, their excellence, as we see in companies like uh, Toyota or Benz and BMW or Honda or Mitsubishi or Sony. You know, all these companies are excelling in their operations. And because of all of their excellence in operations, they had uh, been able to achieve such a quick comeback to the world stage. And for example, if you if we talk about automotive industry, say you know automotive industry, one company like um, uh, G, uh, GM is doing very well. That means 
you know, thousands of suppliers of GM and their uh, accounting companies and finance banks or uh, insurance companies are doing good too. And distributors and dealerships are all associated with this one company called General Motors. When General Motors are doing very well, the entire business, thousands of businesses are doing very well together. So this is called national chain effect. When operations management excels, it's not you know, remaining in one company's uh, profit, but also it has spillover effects over to many industries. So that's why it is so important. If you take a look at this slide, in manufacturing, it's only 14% of US GDP, but it has chain effects. As a result, every $1 of finer demand spent for a manufactured good, it generates 55 cents of GDP in the manufacturing sector, and also 45 cents of GDP in non-manufacturing sector. In other, in other words, 45% of uh, spillover impact onto uh, a service area and 55% of impact in manufacturing industry. So uh, it's like a multiplier impact. When you have multiplier impact in operations, you want to do it well in those area. And Germany and Japan, as Kunzi shared, focused on this area so that they could quickly build the nation and have this uh, spillover impact. So when we are losing this operations management and manufacturing in the nation, we are not just losing that business only. We are losing all these spillover impacts and chain effects in the nation and giving it to other countries. So that's why it is really important considering the chain effects of operations management. So let me share with you this video. Um... Apple's iPhone, sophisticated design, homegrown. Well, not exactly. The idea starts here and the new iPhone's processor is made in Texas, but the battery, its display, and most of its other parts are made somewhere else. The iPhone has hundreds of different components, an estimated 90% of which are manufactured with help from workers in Germany, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, China, and elsewhere. Now, outsourcing to China is a story you've heard before, right? You know, China has millions of unskilled workers willing to work for less than Americans. That's not new. But let's take a look at what happens when manufacturing is overseas. Take semiconductors, the most tiny oh, the essential components of any electronic device. Manufacturing semiconductors happens in three stages. Design, wafer fabrication, and assembly. In the 1960s, U.S. companies started sending local aspects of assembly to Asia. Skilled wafer fabrication followed in the 1980s. And within the last decade, some complex design work has moved overseas. The point is that innovation requires relationships between design teams and factory workers. When low-skill jobs go overseas, it creates a vacuum that increasingly pulls higher-wage jobs abroad as well. And losing manufacturing jobs has other consequences, too. As American manufacturing has declined, our economy has lost what's known as a job multiplier. Let's look at some estimates from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. If America were to create 1,000 auto manufacturing jobs, suddenly auto plants would start ordering more parts from other companies and hiring new managers. Those 1,000 new auto jobs would create other manufacturing jobs, new management jobs, transportation and warehouse jobs, scientific and technical service jobs, as well as various other work. All told, you would add 5,712 total jobs to the economy as a result. Now, Consider what happens if you add 1,000 new hospital jobs. More nurses, for instance, means you create other healthcare jobs, like nurse assistants and lab techs. You create other scientific and technical service jobs and various other positions, but only for a total of about 1,700 jobs. This effect shows up in the American economy right now, where Apple is a huge player. Earlier this year, the value of Apple in the stock market 
made it worth more than the biggest companies in oil, energy, and manufacturing. But Apple only has 43,000 American employees, a fraction of the nearly 400,000 workers that a company like General Motors employed a half century. Actually, if you look back at the largest employers in 1960, you had companies like GM and Ford and General Electric, big manufacturers. If you look at the biggest employers now, though, you have Walmart and Target and Kelly Services for Tevis, big service firms. In other words, the fastest job growth in the American economy today falls into two groups. There are companies like Apple and other firms that hire highly skilled workers like software engineers and designers and pay them very high salaries. For a few elite workers, things are pretty good right now. And at the other end of the spectrum, the number of service jobs, like waiters and medical assistants, has also risen significantly. But wages for these jobs, on average, have been stagnant in the last decade. And the jobs in the middle, the work for everyone else, like salespeople and office assistants, steel workers and manufacturers, those jobs have increasingly disappeared. They've been replaced by robots or advances in technology, or they've been sent overseas. That's why our economic problems are so hard to solve right now, state economists. We've become a nation with fewer chances for people to climb into the middle class. Okay, so so that's the power of of uh, operations management. So as you saw, if you create one thousand jobs in manufacturing, how many additional jobs do you have according to the New York Times? Remember, what, uh, was it like fifty seven hundred or something like that? Yeah, so I remember five thousand five hundred something jobs. What about 1,000 more healthcare jobs. How many more jobs today? It was only like 1,700 healthcare jobs. It didn't increase by that much. So 1,700 more jobs. So compared to um, healthcare or other service job creation, if you create uh, the same job in manufacturing, it is um, how many times? You know, five times more jobs, four times more jobs. And and service jobs. So as we outsource more uh, this production area and operations, we're going to uh, see a depleting, depleting impact in the economy. So here we have uh, um, again chain effect. We industry can be divided into primary sector, secondary sector, and tertiary sector. And we say that the primary sector is the basis, and then we have secondary sectors, such as production of goods, and then we have services built upon that uh, secondary sector. The thing is that if we minimize the secondary sector, what happens is that service industry cannot sustain because we, we don't have the basis for the services. And that's what we have to remember all the time. And one example is Chinese employment. If you look at Chinese employment, the primary industry has been dominant for a long time, but after 2010, it's a decreasing uh, a trend. And secondary industry has grown a lot. As a result, the tertiary industry also grew. So we see the you know this multiplying effects working uh, in Chinese economy as well. So that serves as the warning in the United States because we are shrinking the second secondary sector at this moment. I have a question. Okay. Um, so I know like a lot of people like politically say that um, we should not outsource as much and we should keep jobs here. And that's kind of what that video was saying. Like if we keep jobs here and we don't outsource, um, we'll have more jobs for the economy. But if we don't outsource and we keep jobs here. Um, typically, we pay more for American workers um, because we have like minimum wage standards. How does that affect like the OM of everything? Um, that's a good question. So, you know, the beauty of international trade is that 
according to Ricardo, that we specialize in something so that we can uh, grow the capacity and specialization and skills and make the pie bigger than before uh, um, that we need to be aware of. Um, however, in terms of manufacturing, we don't want to outsource every uh, manufacturing, especially because it's uh, related to innovation, first of all, innovation. Second of all, it serves the basis of the other service industry. So I, I would say that we have to make every effort to protect and grow uh, manufacturing in the United States, especially critical areas such as electronics and, and uh, automotive or uh, military industry. Those things have to be protected and, um, uh, and kept here. Uh, however, you know, we do need to also uh, uh, contribute to the peace and the wealth of the uh, world by, by trading together. So uh, somehow I think the government needs to find a way to streamline the uh, labor cost and support the manufacturing uh, as much as we can so that we can keep it as much as possible here in the United States. Um, so that's my view. Um, yeah, what do you guys think? I wanted to ask if uh, it's cheaper to outsource to other countries, what incentive do businesses have to keep uh, production over here? So that's uh, what we are struggling at this moment. For example, when COVID-19 happened, you know, we realized that we don't have the capability of producing ventilators and masks here in the United States. And it took a long time for us to uh, source them from other countries. The problem was that other sources or other countries were also struggling with these critical uh, items. And as a result, you know, the United States has to ask other companies like uh, uh, GM and uh, other manufacturers to shift their operations and uh, produce uh, those things. So if everything is peaceful and no disruptions happen, then uh, international trade works very well. However, we don't want to, um, you know, outsource critical things. Uh, then, then, you know, we, in times of crisis, we will feel the impact. One good example in economics is uh, uh, crops, you know, rice and meal, uh, wheat and all this uh, agriculture industry. We could import everything from other countries. However, in times of, of crisis or war, or we, not, we may not be able to find the source of that, if especially the country that is uh, importing, we are importing that uh, uh, crops from uh, are turning their back against us, then we are going to be in very difficult situation. So in economics theory, we, he says that uh, uh, we need to keep the uh, critical materials um, and that ha we have the capability to produce them in the country so that we can prepare for the emergency. And what we see in these days is that, I, by the way, I'm not, you know, saying I'm, I'm Republican or Democrat or I'm not endorsing those uh, uh, opinions. But what I'm saying is that um, we, we do need to uh, maintain the cap capabilities to keep things in, in the uh, country when it comes to critical materials. And as we, um, for example, Apple has the capacity and capability to, to keep, uh, keep manufacturing in the United States. They have billions of dollars of cash sitting on their uh, company, sitting on. However, um, they decided recently to open a manufacturing facility, but they could have done it sooner. And, uh, you know, simply because we are, they are looking at money right, profit only. And they are not, they were reluctant to invest in the United States. And I think that could, could improve. You know what I mean? So if we just 
do everything by um, money or profit perspective, they can invite uh, difficulties to the country. Ashley, what do you think? I don't know. I think it's like an interesting topic. Um, and it's definitely something that has like a political stigma to both sides of it. Um, my, like the question I asked, do like, do we tax extra on companies who outsource? Cause I think, I mean, you can, uh, you can only outsource to a certain extent. Um, if you want to create jobs in America, but you can only have so many jobs here if you want to keep costs low. Um, but if you, if like the government was like, okay, you know what, we're not going to outsource as much. We're going to create more jobs for Americans. Um, they, I feel like there'd have to be some sort of tax imposed on companies who do use outsourcing. That way it would make it almost like monetary, like balance between both options. Like outsourcing would be just as much as hiring American workers. Um, but I, I don't know what that effect would be on our economy. Cause as you like showed us in the example, like one little reduction somewhere, um, could cause a big economic difference. Yeah. So that's why I put this reshoring and outsourcing discussion at the end of the case case. One of the cases that one, because that's very critical. Uh, topic and we can stand on both side and it'll be interesting to to debate about it together. Um, I would say in t instead of tax, we give more incentives to to the manufacturers to produce here in the United States, and also um, there could be a campaign to buy made in the United States or made in New Jersey. Uh, uh, I think that could be positive incentives might be a better better thing than taxing. Hmm. Okay, so uh, third topic, I will finish it in five minutes. Um, so uh, thank you for asking this good question. And, uh, um, you know, there could be many sides of that, many facets of that, and you can think of that. And that's why this is the topic of the discussion available on Canvas. And I want you to discuss together, debate together, and it would be uh, great to see that happening. Okay, so here uh, I'm summarizing the pillars of operations management. They are quality and process, inventory and capacity. I say QPIC decisions. We have to make decisions in quality, process, inventory, and capacity. Um, and these are guided by your strategy. For example, like BMW, you can uh, strive for quality or like Walmart, you want to go for cost. So uh, depending on your strategy, you have to make decisions about this QPIC and align them together. Uh, you cannot, you know, Walmart cannot say, oh, I'm going to sell BMW here <laughs> because they are going for cost strategy. Um, so everything else, for example, the warehouse, the distribution system, uh, the service have to be aligned by their strategy and decisions are made according to this strategy. And we also, uh, when you are making strategy that is guided by uh, forecasting, how do you see the future? What do you think is the best or what is the value that you are seeing in the future? And you are uh, forecasting it and making that strategy and then make decisions upon that and that's going to be operations management. So operations management is about quality process and inventory and capacity decisions you are going to make. And depending on your forecasting and, and strategy, you are going to do so. And this course is organized in this way. So operations management, product design, quality, and statistical process control chart will be covered and the exam one will be given to you. And then process design, forecasting, inventory management, and material resource requirement planning will be covered and there will be exam two. And lastly, project management, decision making tools, linear programming, and SAP ERP labs will be given to you at the end and they will cover exam three. And uh, I, I map it out like this, quality decisions and process decisions, inventory decisions, and capacity decisions are embedded in these uh, chapters, and we are going to study that all together. And that's how I designed this study, and we'll go through that. 
So I'm not following uh, the book in a sequential manner, but it's jumbled the flow, and I hope you understand that. Next week, I'm going to talk about operations management strategy. I hope you uh, read the book and uh, come here. And here is the uh, wrap-up. Uh, so the homework is that uh, you have to do DQ1, discussion question one, although you have two weeks to complete it. I encourage you to engage yourself as quick as possible. And this article is attached to the discussion question. And read chapter two. And then we also are going to do case soon. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not competing with audience. That RD case you want to read, uh, RD case, and uh, we are going to uh, keep on moving on. Okay, uh, that's an that's a, a introduction to operations management. And uh, um, thank you very much for your participation. And I'm going to see you next week. And if you have any question, let me know. I will remain in WebEx.